This is the question that everybody needs to answer. What you say about who Jesus is determines your eternity. Now, just to reiterate where we are and to back up and make sure we have the context and understanding of what we're dealing with tonight, this is still the same night. This is the same night that Jesus gets arrested. This is the same night as the Last Supper. This is the same night before the crucifixion and the final trial of Jesus. This is the same night that Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. And tonight we're going to really look into the life of one of his disciples. And in between that, we're going to get a moment about Jesus. And uh, I think maybe your eyes will be opened a little bit into what was going on. But first, let's get this set up because we're dealing with Peter and what Peter has gone through. Now, Peter, up to this point, has said and done a lot of things. One of those things is a long, well, I shouldn't say a long time ago, but to us a long time ago in our process of going through the book of John. But a long while back in Jesus' ministry, he asked a, a very important question. I think maybe the most important question. When he, he sat and asked his disciples, who does the world say that I am? And they came and they, they had some responses about some were wondering if he was John the Baptist, some were wondering if he was a prophet, uh, some were wondering if he was a good teacher, and some were wondering if he was the Messiah. And Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? This is the question that everybody needs to answer. What you say about who Jesus is determines your eternity. And without hesitation, Peter was the one who took that step and leaped in front of everybody and said, Lord, you are the Son of God, the Messiah. And Jesus said to Peter, well done. That did not come from you, but you, that must have been revealed to you by the Father. And then he told Jesus, upon this rock, I will build my church, meaning Jesus... Peter is going to be the foundation for Jesus' church. Now, after the events that we get into tonight, we see some of that fruition in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, in chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit come down on all of the disciples who are praying as they're meeting in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And they all start speaking in tongues, and Peter preaches the first sermon that really makes a difference in the world. And because of Peter's words out to the community, as everyone is driving into Jerusalem, 3,000 people were added to the church that day because of Peter. And the foundation of the church began with Peter's sermon. We also see Peter later on in the book of Acts being the first one of the disciples to baptize a Gentile and to bring a Gentile into the church. So not only for Jerusalem and for the Jews, but to bring the gospel out to the world, Peter's the foundation of it all. Peter had a lot of confidence, and rightfully so. Look at what he will do in the future, and look at what he has done in the past. What Jesus has already said about him, you're the rock I will build my church on. And Peter has also walked on water. Now Peter fell, on the water when he looked at the wind and the waves and he cried out for help from Jesus. But of the disciples at the Last Supper, which one of them can say that they walked out to Jesus on the water and had enough faith to stand on top of it? Only Peter. Peter earlier this evening also told Jesus at the Last Supper that he was willing to die for him. And there's no way he would ever give up on Jesus. And now you start to see the swelling of pride in Peter's heart. Well, Peter also 
while Jesus was praying. Now, a couple weeks ago, we went through John 17 where Jesus was praying. But the other Gospels go into Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we find out some interesting information. That Peter, James, and John went with Jesus to pray. And while Jesus was praying, they fell asleep. Multiple times, Jesus came back to those three disciples and said, can you not just pray with me for one hour? Can you not stay awake and wait for me for one hour? This is after the bold proclaims of Peter saying, there's no way I'd ever give up on you. I, my life is, I'm going to go to the grave for you, Jesus. But only a couple hours later, Peter can't even stay up to pray with Jesus. And so he's already experienced overconfidence and failure. He's already experienced overcompensation. Because what we read last week was that that same night, Judas came with a group of servants from the temple and guards from the temple to arrest Jesus. And Peter, against the will of Jesus, cut off the ear of one of the guards. Jesus healed the guard and told Peter that it wasn't okay. And at this moment, Jesus says, he responds to those who are looking to arrest him, that he is the one they're looking for. He's the one they're looking to arrest. And he says, take me, leave the rest, let them go. And he instructs his disciples to go and leave. And we're going to see where that, what happened there as we pick up. But before we do, just imagine, put yourself in Peter's shoes. Have you ever let down the person you didn't want to let down the most? There's a reason that it's a famous phrase for parents to say, I'm not angry with you. I'm just disappointed. Because it's the moment for a kid who loves, the, if, they're, if they have a healthy relationship with their parents, when a parent says that to their kid, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed, their world crumbles. It's worse. I'd rather you be upset with me than disappointed in what I did. And think about Peter. Peter has been following Jesus for three and a half years. He's had a lot of successes along the way. He's done a lot of things right. He even made it into Jesus' inner circle. Among the 12 disciples, Peter, James, and John were the three that were always with Jesus. Peter saw the transfiguration of Jesus. He saw Moses and Elijah. He even offered to build them booths. Peter went fishing and miraculously caught a coin to pay the temple tax because of what Jesus had ordered. Peter had walked on water. Peter was told he was going to be the foundation that starts the church. And this is where we pick up with him. After already cutting off the ear of Malchus, temple guard, it says, Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. This is likely John. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke, uh, and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now, earlier in the evening, Peter had made a proclamation to Jesus that he would never let him down, that he would go to the grave for Jesus, that he would never deny him. And Jesus looked back at Peter and said, I tell you the truth, this night you're going to deny me three times. And Peter refused to believe it. This also happened to be on the same night when Jesus announced that he was going to be betrayed by one of his disciples. And I'm sure Peter was looking to make sure that he wasn't the one who was the betrayer. Well, they've already witnessed the betrayal. Judas came and got Jesus arrested. And so Peter might have let his guard down. 
thinking, whew, I'm not the one who betrays Jesus. But here he is doing exactly what Jesus said he would do. He denies that he's one of Jesus' disciples. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coals stood, stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And we, when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? This is what's going on. Peter and another disciple, likely John, are there. They followed Jesus after his arrest and went to the temple, or I shouldn't say the temple, they went to the high priest's house to go witness this trial. Now, Peter's already denied having known Jesus or being his disciple. That's already a mark on his record. But let me ask you a question. Where are the other disciples? We know John's there. We know Judas betrayed Jesus. There's nine others. Where are they? Not there. So as much flack as we're going to give Peter tonight, recognize at least he had the bravery to follow Jesus and witness what was going on. It was also against Jesus' instructions because he told them to go. But still, he was there, and now we see a trial of Jesus. Now, there are a lot of problems with this trial. First of all, let me go through a list for you. Jesus was arrested at night. They went to the high priest's house. They have this trial going on. Let me explain some of what's wrong with it. There are rules written in Jewish law in the Mishnah and the Talmud. And these are some things that were broken that night simply out of their hatred for Jesus. One, during a trial, members of the Sanhedrin were allowed to speak in defense of the accused, but not against him. However, the high priest speaks against Jesus. The high priest isn't supposed to cast a judgment against the defendant, but he does. That's against Jewish law. For the verdict to be valid, the trial had to be held at the Hall of Hewnstone inside the temple precinct, but Jesus' trial was held at the high priest's house. So it's in the wrong place. The high priest is doing the opposite of what his job is. Third, the trial could not be held at night. The trials, only, the trials are only supposed to be held during the day. And they're not supposed to be held during one of the feast holidays, and this is Passover. So we're seeing quite a bit going wrong. All the witnesses were supposed to be examined separately, Yet, when the witnesses against Jesus didn't match, they brought forward together two false witnesses. Each member of the Sanhedrin also had to give their verdict separately, but they all choose to say that Jesus is guilty together. The youngest member of the Sanhedrin is supposed to render his verdict so as not to be influenced by the older, more powerful members. So the youngest is supposed to vote first, and move up the ranks so that the youth aren't influenced by the wisdom of the elders. However, the exact opposite happens here. The high priest is the first one to cast judgment. And if the sentence was death, a night was supposed to elapse after the day of the verdict before the death sentence was carried out. Yet Jesus was crucified within a few hours of this verdict. So within Jewish law, the religious leaders who were supposed to be the ones who held tightly to their oral tradition and the laws that they had written in their traditions. And the high priest is the highest level of authority. 
in that, and they all break several of their own laws to convict Jesus. So this is a kangaroo court we've got going on here. And now we get introduced to another character. Now, the high priest is Caiaphas. He struck Jesus, which is also something that the high priest shouldn't do. But now we pick up in verse 24, and we see something really interesting. Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. What is that? I thought Caiaphas was the high priest. So who was it that was doing the questioning before. Well, here's what's going on. Annas used to be the high priest. Annas is the moral authority in Judaism at the time because when you are the high priest, you're supposed to be the high priest for life. So Annas is the moral authority and the religious leader of the Jews. However, Caiaphas has the office because the Jews aren't in charge of their district anymore. The Romans get to choose who the high priest is. And they picked Caiaphas to be their representative for the Jewish people. So we already see a lot of underhanded stuff going on. Now Simon, Simon Peter, stood and warmed warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. So for a second time, Peter is recognized and he denies knowing Jesus. Now what we're witnessing is an illegal arrest, an illegal trial, illegal usage of authority, the wrong authorities making decisions, in the wrong place, at the wrong time, not following through on their own orders, and at the same time, Peter doing exactly what Jesus said he would do, deny him. On a night where all of the confidence in Peter is now gone. He's let down Jesus twice. He cut the ear off of one of the guards. He didn't listen to Jesus' demands when he told him to, to scatter. And it says, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him, whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Now this is important because earlier that night, when Peter was making a proclamation of his devotion to Jesus, and saying that he would never let him down and he would go to the grave for him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. So imagine being in Peter's shoes. You're there. You've let him down. You failed in a lot of ways. You failed to stay up when he asked you to pray with him. You cut off the ear of one of the servants and you get reprimanded by Jesus. You get told to go scatter. You don't do that. You actually find the courage to go follow him and witness what's going to go down. And as you're watching a trial that you know is illegal because you know the traditions of your people, you refuse to stand up for your rabbi three times. And then on the third time, a rooster crows, and it shocks you into reality. It shocks you into the notion that you just did exactly what Jesus said you were going to do. You let him down. And so we see the the cycle, the things that led Peter to this moment, the pride that crept up in Peter as he earned a place of favor among Jesus' followers, and the confidence that he had in himself because of the things he had done throughout the ministry of Jesus. We see his failure, his failure to pray, his failure to have faith on the water, his failure to listen to Jesus. Instead, he acts with his emotion and he cuts off the ear. And now we see the overcompensation. That's cutting off the ear of the servant. After your failure, you try to become braggadocious to cover up the failure. 
You do something big to make sure you're still in the right footing. But Jesus looks at you and says, that's the wrong thing. It wasn't right, Peter. And now he's following Jesus in the middle of the night. at This kangaroo court. And the last step. Because he already feels so separated from his Messiah. Because he already took steps away from him. Because he failed. He feels so far away from Jesus that when he's asked about him, the last step is denial. He denies his Savior. He denies his Messiah, his rabbi that he's been following. He left his business. He left his family for three and a half years to follow him around and do ministry. Peter has cast demons out of people and walked on water. And at this moment, he feels so far away from Jesus, even though he can see him, that he denies him. Now, what I'll tell you is this is scary. It's scary because it's not out of the realm of possibility for any one of us. It's not out of the realm of possibility for any one of us to think that our relationship with Jesus is good enough. And because we think it's good enough, because we do the things we're supposed to do, whether that's going to church or serving or praying or reading our Bible or whatever it is that you think it is that you need to do, if you've done enough of it, it's easy to get confident and think, I've done enough. I know my faith is in a good place. And it's easy to slack off and to get a little lazy and to fail a little bit. Maybe backslide a little bit into old behaviors. Do things that you did before you got saved because you became too confident in your faith, too reliant on the grace of God, and you start sliding away. And if someone calls you on it, Or even in your own heart, if you feel guilty about it, it's easy to put on a brave face. Maybe show up to church. Maybe raise your hands and sing a little louder that week so that you'll look the part even if you're tearing yourself up inside because you've slidden back a little bit. But here's the good news. Jesus was not shocked by Peter's behavior. Jesus predicted Peter's behavior. But Jesus' prediction of Peter's behavior didn't end with his denial. In fact, long before Peter's denial, Jesus predicted that Peter would be the rock the church was built on. Turns out, Peter fulfills both of those roles. He has a bad night. He ends up losing a little bit of faith this night. He ends up in a moment that's scared. One of us that I I don't know that any of us can really grasp or understand. He's standing in the midst of the trial with the people who arrested Jesus. I'm sure he's thinking, if I admit that I'm one of his disciples, maybe I might get arrested. I certainly don't want to look like the person defending Jesus when the high priest is hitting him. That's not going to go well for me. I will be socially ostracized if I stand up for Jesus in this moment, regardless of the fact that I'm watching them break the law. The problem is the people breaking the law are the law. They're the ones who enforce the rules on the rest of us. I don't know if that sounds familiar. But the enforcers of the rules, the rules for thee, not for me, I think we've witnessed a lot of that in our own culture. But he's standing there and he's afraid. And he should be afraid. I don't think there's any reason not to be afraid. And he did exactly what Jesus thought he would do, told him he would do. But not that much later down the road, just a little over a month down the road, Peter preaches a sermon that brings 3,000 people into the church. What's the difference? 
What's the difference between this night where Peter fails and he goes through this cycle of being overconfident and failing, overcompensating and denying Jesus to the Peter that we see in the book of Acts that preaches in a language that everybody can understand and brings 3,000 new members into the church. What's the difference? The difference is the resurrection. The difference is the Last Supper and what it represented became no longer a representation, but a fulfillment. The sacrifice and the death of Jesus, the breaking of his body and the spilling out of his blood was no longer a story Jesus was telling them, but a reality that they saw. And then they witnessed the resurrection and they saw death turn to life. And that's the difference. So on this side of history, we're lucky that we're already on the side of the resurrection. Because the power for the Holy Spirit already is available to us. And so tonight is communion night. And we're going to be celebrating and remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. Because what we're remembering is this night. And what it led to. The death and resurrection of Jesus. And what we're remembering is the difference between the Peter in John chapter 18 and the Peter in Acts chapter 2. The difference between someone who's afraid and someone who's so bold he brings 3,000 people into the church and baptizes them on the same day. So what I'm going to do is invite you all to stand up, and as you do, we're going to have a song playing uh, where you can come and collect the elements. When you come and collect the elements, go around the outside edges back to your seat, and then we'll take the elements together. So if everybody would stand and please come and collect the elements for communion.